Hello, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the next panel at the Sachs Associates Neuroscience Innovation Forum. This panel's topic will be discussion of pain, addiction, and migraine. Uh, my name is Ram Selvaraju. I'm a managing director and senior healthcare equity research analyst at HC Wainwright and Company. It's my pleasure to introduce the following panelists. Andrea Small Howard, Chief Science Officer and Director at GB Sciences. Mark Demitrak, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Trevena. Norbert Riedel, Chief Executive Officer at Aptinix. Pradeep Banerjee, Executive Director at AbbVie. Randall Stevens, Chief Medical Officer at Centrexion Therapeutics, and Seth Leatherman, Co-Founder, Chairman, and CEO at Tonics Pharmaceuticals Holding Corporation. Uh, I will now leave the panelists to introduce themselves one by one. Andrea, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Um, my name is Andrea Small Howard. As Ram mentioned, I am the Chief Science Officer and a Director at GB Sciences where we take a natural product approach to the discovery of novel therapeutics for pain, um, utilizing plant-based compounds in complex mixtures uh, that demonstrate synergy. And um, that's our approach. Thank you, Mark. Yes, this is Mark Demetrak, uh, Chief Medical Officer at Trevena. Trevena is a CNS-focused commercial stage company we uh, recently launched uh, our first product, uh, Alinvic, which is a parenteral opioid for the treatment of acute pain, the first uh, novel uh, chemical entity uh, in this space uh, in decades, uh, providing uh, an important advance uh, in the treatment of acute pain. We have several other um, G-protein coupled receptor uh, targeted agents in development uh, for a variety of neuroscience indications. The technology that underlies our company is based on science that emerged from the lab of Dr. Bob Lefkowitz at Duke University, which provided some insights into the um, differential regulation of some of the post-receptor signaling molecules associated with G-protein coupled receptors. It's a pleasure to participate in this morning's panel. Thank you. Norbert? Yeah, thank you, Ram. <clears throat> Norbert Riedel, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Aptinix. The focus of our company is entirely on diseases of the central nervous system with a primary focus on chronic pain, PTSD, and cognition impairment. Our focus is on the NMDA receptor, a very well-researched and characterized receptor involved in normal brain physiology and associated with a wide spectrum of diseases of the central nervous system. We have developed small synthetic molecules that act as modulators of the NMDA receptor, which in our preclinical studies and in our clinical studies shows that these compounds that are all proprietary to the company have efficacy in that they normalize NMDA receptor activity and do so in a modulatory fashion, as I mentioned. They also have a highly advantageous safety and tolerability profile, which is particularly relevant to the treatment of chronic diseases. We advanced the company in the last five years from being preclinical stage to having multiple compounds in phase two development, as I mentioned, with a focus on chronic pain. PTSD, as well as cognition impairment. And I really am delighted to be invited to participate in this panel. Thank you. Thank you. I should also mention, just in the interest of full disclosure, that H.C. Wainwright, and in particular myself as analyst, cover Aptinix with a buy rating. Uh, in addition, I'd like to now turn the floor over to Pradeep to introduce himself. Thank you. Thanks, Ram. Uh, my, my name is Pradeep Banerjee. I'm with Avi neuroscience development. Um, I recently joined Abby with Abby's uh, acquisition of Allergan. So I was with Allergan before. Uh, obviously, uh, very interested in migraine therapeutics and, and chronic pain. Uh, Abby recently got an approval for acute migraine. Uh, so we have a CGRP antagonist that is approved now. It's called Ubrojapant or UberLV. And there is another CGRP uh, antagonist in development uh, in phase three. 
for migraine prevention. So it's a very exciting uh, times uh, for, for developing migraine therapeutics. And I'm very familiar with Norbert's work. When I was in uh, Aragon, I used to work with Nor uh, Aptonex. Uh, in context to migraine, there is obvious a uh, very high interest in glutamatergic modulation to develop newer therapeutics, uh, you know, for either prevention or acute. Uh, so looking forward to this discussion today. Thanks. Thank you. Randall? I'm Randall Stevens. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Centrexian Therapeutics, which is a company focused on non-opioid, non-addictive analgesics. Uh, we have both oral, uh, topical, and working on intrathecal therapies for chronic pain that include uh, SSTR4 agonist, a CB2 agonist, a CCR2 antagonist, and uh, topical high concentration lidocaine as well as intraarticular capsaicin for knee osteoarthritis. So we're a development stage company and I'm very happy to be invited. Thanks very much. And last but not least, Seth, please. Thank you, Ram. Uh, I'm delighted to be on the panel. My name is Seth Letterman. I'm the CEO of Tonix, T-O-N-I-X Pharmaceuticals. And we have programs uh, in all three of the main areas on the panel. Uh, we have a pretty diverse portfolio of products. They're all development stage, and they range from small molecules uh, to peptides to recombinant proteins. In the pain space, we are in mid phase three for fibromyalgia, where we're developing a sublingual version of cyclobenzaprine, which is a tricyclic and uh, we had a positive phase three study in fibromyalgia last year. In the addiction space, we have a treatment for cocaine intoxication that's a recombinant protein from bacteria that degrades, detoxifies cocaine in vivo. And we also have a program on alcohol use disorder. Uh, the cocaine intoxication program is going back into phase two imminently. Uh, and in migraine, we're developing a proprietary uh, formulation of oxytocin in, as an intranasal delivery vehicle. And uh, this is the first trial, also we'll be starting this year, is for the treatment of chronic migraine. Very exciting time to be in the areas of pain addiction and migraine. And I'm delighted to be on the panel today with the other leaders in, the, in these spaces. Great. Thank you very much, all. So without further ado, I thought we would start by setting the stage in discussing the different indication areas that are the focus of the panel today. And I thought we would start with the pain indications. Now, obviously, we can uh, split those, just generally speaking, into both acute and chronic pain. But I thought I would let each of the panelists in turn uh, specifically talk about their approaches to the pain space, the specific pain sub-indications that they're focused on, and what in particular they feel is likely to be especially disruptive about the approaches they are taking. Andrea, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Um, yes. So what we have done is we've been focused on the TRIP family or the transient receptor potential family of ion channels slash receptors, which have been um, demonstrated to be involved in both in chronic pain, both inflammatory chronic pain as well as in neuropathic uh, chronic pain. And um, our approach has been to use, a, as, as I mentioned earlier, a natural products approach, whereby we were looking specifically within the cannabis plant for molecules that would be uh, potential agonists and antagonists for these receptors and using a combination of cell and animal models, as well as an um, acceleration program using um, machine learning, we have, dis we have discovered several putative formulations that are optimized therapeutic mixtures that contain um, molecules that do manipulate multiple trip channels simultaneously as a way to desensitize these, uh, the pain perception pathways um, for chronic pain. In addition, our our um, approach involves combining these plant-based molecules with delivery methods, which make them even more effective. So we've uh, been involved in a collaboration with the University of Sevilla in Spain, and we have uh, been able to encapsulate the active plant molecules in time-release nanoparticles. And in one proof of concept study that we have uh, data on, 
we've shown that a single oral dose of these nanoparticles was able to alleviate pain for 11 days in a rodent model compared to the unencapsulated ingredients, which only provided about a day's worth of pain relief. Um, we have extended this now, and we're, we have these, the more of these complex formulations that are currently in animal trials at um, the NRC in Canada. And so our, what we believe that it's gonna be the most helpful for the field is to have novel plant-based molecules that are being applied and rigorously tested and also put into delivery methods wherein the modalities are very appropriate for treating chronic conditions. Uh, there, you know, traditionally, a lot of chronic pain medicines are basically, you know, the same as some of the acute, but we believe that this methodology will help specifically with the chronic because the delivery modes will allow for that extended uh, relief over time. Great. Thanks very much. Mark, why don't we shift to you now? I understand that uh, one of the core areas of focus at Trevina is a post-operative pain management setting, which is more in the acute hospital context. Why don't you take us through your approach there? Sure. Let me make a few comments about that. As I mentioned, uh, the, the overarching uh, scientific thrust of our development is targeting the G-protein coupled receptor um, as, a, as a pharmacologic target with a recognition that post-receptor signaling uh, can be manipulated um, based on the binding to the receptor itself. The two main pathways of interest be being G-protein signaling or beta-arrestin signaling to sort of over, oversimplify uh, the, the mechanism. Uh, in the acute pain arena, uh, we've recently launched olaceridine under the brand name Alinvic. It binds to the mu opioid receptor, which is a G-protein coupled receptor. The important uh, issue for us uh, is we spent quite a bit of time uh, developing a compound that selectively targets G-protein activation with relatively little engagement in beta arrestin. That's a very uh, interesting model because there's a significant amount of animal pharmacology that would argue that by doing that, you can preserve the analgesic potential of mu uh, activation while relatively decreasing the uh, opioid uh, related adverse event uh, profile. So one of our challenges in clinical development has been to translate those animal observations into a product um, in clinical use. And a considerable amount of our development work has been targeted on that differentiating um, profile. The one thing I would comment on that I think is sort of pertinent to the topic of pain in general is that opioids uh, really remain a mainstay of the management of acute pain in the hospital setting. For certain types of highly painful surgical procedures or medical procedures, there simply is no other option that provides the analgesic relief that we can obtain from opioids. So while we've, uh, as a, a public health issue, we've made tremendous innovations into focusing and narrowing the clinical application of uh, opioid medications, there will, uh, for the foreseeable future, remain a role uh, for opioid medications in acute pain management. What we believe is important is to do that while at the same time reducing the risk or liability of opioid-related adverse events, which obviously complicate the overall uh, clinical management. And that's that's really been the, the important innovation. I can touch later on in the conversation about other compounds in our pipeline that are more relevant towards uh, chronic pain targets and novel GPCR uh, tar targets in that regard, but I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Norbert, why don't you take us through uh, Aptinix's focus on various chronic pain indications? And in particular, I think it would be helpful for us to get a sense of the size and nature of the unmet medical need and commercial opportunities in these arenas and uh, your rationale for selecting, for example, diabetic peripheral neuropath neuropathic pain uh, as one of the core foci here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, our focus is on chronic pain. And the reason is that as acute pain transitions over time into chronic pain, I think it is quite well established that that goes along with changes in the perception as well as in the processing of pain. And I mentioned in my introductory remarks that our focus is on the NMDA receptor. That receptor is very well characterized 
and known to be involved in make, causing changes in what we call synaptic plasticity. And so if you associate a centralized pain manifestation with chronic pain, then it applies to all chronic pain states. And that would be fibromyalgia that we already mentioned here. It would be diabetic peripheral neuropathy, but it would also be lower back pain, osteoarthritis-related pain, chemotherapy-associated chronic pain, and that's our area of focus. The total market or the total size of the patient population is in excess of 100 million people in the United States alone that suffer from chronic pain. So it's enormous. The unmet need is very high because there's only two approved drugs today, Cymbalta and Lyrica. They both command about $5 billion in annual sales. And while they convey a degree of efficacy, I think they are burdened with a pretty significant side effect profile and increasingly clear with abuse liability that goes along in particular with, with Lyrica. So let me briefly, briefly touch on fibromyalgia, where we have done uh, a biomarker study some time ago that clearly shows a change in the connectivity of brain regions involved in the perception and processing of pain and a reduction in the hyperconnectivity of those brain regions by using NYX2925, our lead NMDA receptor modulator in the pain indication. That goes along also with reductions in glutamate levels, which are known to be elevated at the resting state, as well as in evoked pain states in fibromyalgia and other chronic pain. And we could readily see a reduction in those elevated glutamate levels as well. Along with those biomarkers, where reductions, statistically significant reductions in pain reported by those patients that participate in the study, and based on those very, very encouraging results, we are now in a larger 300-patient fibromyalgia study where we are looking at two active arms against placebo. And that study is targeted to read out in the first half of 2022. The second indication where we are very active is painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. We have done a rather large phase two uh, dose ranging and efficacy study already and could see that patients who have suffered from DPN for a longer period of time, several years, are particularly responsive to NYX2925 in alleviating multiple readouts of pain, acute daily pain, worse daily pain, pain on walking, and so on. And based on those results, we have started at the end of last year, I should say restarted because we paused because of COVID-19, but restarted a 200 patient DPN study, which is uh, enrolling as planned, and is also scheduled to read out in the first half of 2022. But the key takeaway really is plasticity changes associated with chronic pain, NMDA receptor mediated corrections of those plasticity changes, and our compounds being modulators of the NMDA receptor that as positive allosteric modulators induce those plasticity changes, in our view, provide a clear result of efficacy and activity and with a highly, highly advantageous safety and tolerability profile, no side effects we have seen that truly differ from placebo and no abuse liability, as well as no off-target binding of these compounds to any other known receptor or transporter or membrane-associated protein that is typically looked at in these panels. So I pause there and uh, hope that provided a bit of an overview of what we do in chronic pain. Thanks, Ram. Thank you so much. And uh, Randall, uh, over to you now. My understanding is that Centrexion is focusing on knee osteoarthritis as well as diabetic neuropathy, among other things. Why don't you walk us through Centrexion's take on these indications, please? Sure. So, uh, like Andrew's approach, when we looked at some of the molecules, we did a big, big data analytics assessment of the literature to see where the fit would be best for some of our molecules. So in the case of um, the TRIP-V1 um, agonist uh, capsaicin, we've actually looked at intraarticular capsaicin for the treatment of chronic 
uh, moderate to severe knee pain. And what we've seen, and it's published in a phase two trial, is that with a single injection of uh, capsaicin, what you have is a rapid onset of analgesia that's statistically significant within a week and is durable out through almost uh, six months with a slight decrease in the analgesic effect at six months, but maintained pretty steadily through four months. The benefit of this approach is that with the proper concentration of capsaicin, you actually cause a reduction in the number of active distal nerve terminals in trip one pain fibers. And because of that, the nerves tend to grow back relatively slowly. So a single application of capsaicin which is essentially gone from the body within eight to 12 hours, gives you months of analgesic effect. Because capsaicin is metabolized by nine CYP enzymes and the concentration systemically is a thousand fold lower than what you have intraarticularly, then there's no issue with DDI, drug drug interactions, as well as the total exposure is uh, only for 12 hours or less but the analgesia lasts for months. And the adverse friend profile looks similar to placebo. So we're uh, concentrating on that for knee osteoarthritis as well as on our CCR2 antagonist. So CCR2 antagonists, we've demonstrated in preclinical and in their early phase one trials that uh, we have a CCR2 focused with a CCR5 effect as well. And you, CCR2 and CCR5 are uh, regulating the monocyte macrophage line. So it reduces inflammatory arthritis, but also has effects at the DRG. And so uh, the CCR2 antagonist has shown a dose-dependent uh, change in MCP1 or CCL2, which is the ligand for uh, CCR2, as well as Rontase, which is the ligand for CCR5. So that trial... Uh, phase two trial will be starting this year for knee osteoarthritis. In the case of uh, neuropathic pain, our focus has been uh, that with CB2, because CB2 that we have is a CB2 agonist, which is 16,000 fold more um, inhibitory or actually agonist effect. Uh, than CB1. So CB2 to CB1 ratio is 16,000 to 1. And we're looking at this as has been said at the potentially uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. But the interesting thing in the literature is indicating that both CB2 and CCR2 may be beneficial in chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, both in treating but also in preventing those neuropathic uh, conditions after chemotherapy. So we have a number of different uh, other indications we'll be looking at, but that gives you an idea that we're looking at small fiber neuropathy, we're looking at diabetic peripheral neuropathy, potentially chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, um, osteoarthritis and other inflammatory types of pain, as well as uh, treating uh, nociceptive pain uh, using trip v one with capsaicin, and we're looking into the intrathecal approach as well for those patients who have failed multiple therapeutics and require something which is delivered through the uh, spine. Thanks very much. Seth, maybe you can just give us a brief overview of the fibromyalgia program at Tonix and also set the stage for us with respect to the uh, current marketed product landscape and the degree to which fibromyalgia remains an unmet medical need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. Yeah, so we, we are working on uh, TNX-102SL, which is a sublingual form of cyclobenzaprine. And it is, cyclobenzaprine is a tricyclic. And although the tricyclics are viewed as a class, they really have unique spectra of interacting with different neurotransmitter receptors and reuptake um, <clears throat> systems. So uh, our medicine is sublingual so that you get transmucosal absorption, bypass first pass hepatic metabolism. And the idea is that um, our drug gets the brain pretty efficiently and inhibits uh, four, four receptors, 5-HT2A, alpha-1, uh, H1, and also M1. So all of those are involved in sleep quality. 
And we believe that the mechanism for our product is to improve sleep quality. And for those of you who know that fibromyalgia is a pain syndrome, but it's really a syndrome. So there are a number of different things, probably the three key uh, symptoms in fibromyalgia are pain, sleep problems, and fatigue. And the sleep problems are called in, in this area, uh, non-restorative sleep. And we kind of took the idea that if you could treat non-restorative sleep, maybe that wouldn't be just a symptomatic approach, but if people could sleep better, then maybe their other symptoms would get better. So we've done two considerable uh, phase two studies at a lower dose, and now we've done one phase three study at a higher dose. And the phase three study was remarkable for it hit on its primary endpoint, but also we have activity in both sleep quality and in fatigue. So we think that what's unique about our um, product offering, if, if the results are, are confirmed in, phase, in the phase three that's ongoing, is that it has uh, excellent tolerability, but also broad spectrum activity. So Ram asked that I comment on the marketplace. Well, it's a heavily generic marketplace with um, Lyrica or Pregabalin went generic in 2018 and Cymbalta or Duloxetine went generic in 2014. And each of those drugs achieved peak market sales of about $5 billion a year before they went generic. When Lyrica went generic, it was Pfizer's largest drug product. And when Cymbalta went generic, it was Lilly's largest drug product. So they were considerable markets. Now, each of them had other indications, but I believe that the uh, DTC promotion was focused on, uh, on the fibromyalgia indication. So in general, the market research tells us that more than half of fibromyalgia patients are dissatisfied. And I was a rheumatologist at Columbia for a number of years at a rheumatology clinic. And rheumatology is the uh, specialty where the key opinion leaders in, in fibromyalgia uh, tend to be concentrated. And uh, fibromyalgia patients are uh, quite unique, I think. They're very educated. They look at the internet for new solutions. They're constantly looking for new answers. And they often will bring things to the doctor and ask them, what about this? What about that? So I think it's a very interesting group of people. They don't take no for an answer. They want to try uh, the you know, new medicines and the rest of it. So I think that this will be a very um, uh, interesting marketplace and it'll be very exciting, you know, if we're successful and some of the other panelists, if they're successful in bringing these products, I mean, it has been a long time since there's been a new product in the market for fibromyalgia patients and they are desperate for new therapies. Thank you so much. And now um, I wanted to shift to a discussion of the migraine indication. And I thought, Pradeep, you know, uh, how better to kick this off with than uh, with you? And in particular, I was thinking that it would be helpful for you to walk us through kind of the evolution of the migraine market as uh, the treatment landscape has started to shift in an accelerating way from traditional modalities, like, for example, the triptan class to these upcoming emerging modalities like the anti-CGRP antibodies and the oral CGRP modulators. And in particular, when it comes to AbbVie's own portfolio in this space, if you can walk us through what you think the discrete market opportunities are for both Ubrogapant and Togapant. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ram. Uh, this, is, this, this is really interesting because you know, we, we looked at the triptan, uh, you know, era, and we all know the, you know, the side effect and tolerability profiles that are associated with triptan usage. And, and the CGRP is, is, is certainly, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, developed by chance. I mean, it was a very uh, tailored and, and well-directed invention. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, at AFV, uh, we are very interested to understand, you know, the areas that are that are going to give us a better therapeutic strategy, which are outside of the triptan space, or you know, for you know, in general, in, outside of the serotonin space. Uh, 
obviously there are issues. I mean, you know, we want to develop therapies that, you know, have better efficacy, better responder rates, and, and you know, the baggages and the liabilities that we all know about medication overuse, headache that, that happens with opioids and triptans. Uh, triptans are, are, you know, loaded with cardiovascular side effects. So, you know, we, we wanted to develop something that, that lacked those side effects and retain uh, the efficacy profile that, that we are looking into in, in this migraine population. Now, you know, even within CGRP, it's the biology of CGRP receptors is very complicated, and, and it gives us a, uh, you know, we are looking at various aspects of CGRP targeting. Uh, there are families of CGRP receptors. There are amylin receptors, adrenomelin receptors, which are very closely linked to CGRPs, and all of them to some extent, they kind of modulate, uh, you know, the headache uh, pain that we see in migraine. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we believe, I mean, all the data that suggests right now is seems like, you know, CGRP uh, targeting or even, even other neuropeptides like substance P or PACAP targeting. I mean, they are, they're all, you know, restricted to the periphery. We are not even looking at what brain signaling means to us. And, and, you know, folks who have, you know, aura that comes before migraine, is it possible for us to look at the aura space and, and get into a, a therapeutic modality that can tell us that we can prevent migraine attacks rather than therapeutically intervening after the migraine attack is, is, has onset? So these are the areas we are, we are very much uh, interested in looking at. And obviously, Ubro Japan, you know, and, and Ato Japan, these are the two CGRP prototype G pants that we are, we are developing. I mean, one is, is approved. But, I mean, you know, if you look into the CGRP space, I mean, you know, the, the, you know like Mark suggested, I mean, you know, there are opioids, there are other uh, you know, uh, G protein coupled receptor ligands that can be developed without without liabilities, and you know, biased agonism not only in the opioid space, but we can look at biased agonism in the CGRP and other other uh, you know other receptor uh, cascades. And and obvious interest is is not only you know the uh, the CGRP related drugs, but the ion channels. I mean, ion channels are and like like Andrea suggested, I mean, they are so important, and we are obviously very interested in glutamatergic or the GABAergic signaling that are associated with with in in pain, in headache pain, in in all kinds of pain. So uh, this is uh, you know, I mean, the the strategy for developing this particular you know the migraine therapeutics, which is and uh, not which is outside of triptan and outside of, to some extent, outside of opioids is very interesting. And that's what Abby is working on right now. Thanks very much. Mark, I was wondering if we could revert back to you. I think uh, some of Pradeep's comments may actually be relevant here with respect to the activities that Trevina is pursuing in the migraine arena, particularly with the TRV250 program. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and uh, the specifics of the target in question. Yes, yeah. Pradeep uh, had mentioned the idea that there's really an array of, of pharmacologic targets of interest, and we're only beginning to sort of scratch the surface. What we've been doing with TRV250, this is a compound that is directed at the delta opioid receptor. Uh, delta opioid receptor has, has been of interest uh, in pain, um, in depression, and anxiety for, for several years, as people probably know. One of the real challenges associated um, with development of compounds at this target is the on-target liability for convulsive uh, consequences. So what our discovery team had done, uh, building on this expertise in developing biased uh, ligands, we developed TRV250 with the intent of engineering out that uh, on-target liability. And we believe that we've done that. We've advanced TRV250 into early phase one uh, development. And again, our broader um, interest, and so let, let me just step back, it is a G-protein selective, relatively little beta arrestin 
uh, engaged uh, compound at the delta uh, receptor. The reason it's of interest to us uh, with regard to, to migraine is clearly the distribution of delta receptors in the brain are in the relevant areas of interest. It's involved in pain regulation, uh, mood, anxiety. There's also some emerging interest in its potential role as an upstream regulator of CGRP uh, signaling. So with regard to migraine, the broader interest, with my background as a, as a psychiatrist, I'm very interested in the fact that migraine is not only a pain condition dimensionally, but it also has a behavioral component associated with it. Over half of migraine sufferers have both mood or anxiety symptoms or a combination of the two, sometimes in, acute, um, in an acute migraine attack. That can actually exacerbate or make more difficult to treat the, the acute migraine uh, episode. Our interest in the Delta receptor target is that it brings to the table something different uh, from available uh, migraine therapies in that it has the potential to not only treat the pain component of a migraine, but actually have some beneficial effect on the behavioral uh, component, something that would be a really unique pharmacologic offering uh, in this space. So that's that's really, uh, in a nutshell, our our interest in this target and what we've done up to this point. So we're quite excited about that opportunity. Thanks. And Seth, I think it would be really helpful and insightful and uh, interesting for the audience uh, for you to tell us a little bit about uh, the intranasal oxytocin approach that you folks are taking. And uh, clearly, this appears to be a hitherto untested approach in migraine, but uh, certainly would love to hear uh, about your uh, uh, scientific uh, hypothesis underlying taking this approach to addressing the migraine space. Thank you, Ram. Oxytocin is a natural hormone. It's most famous for the uh, being released in the maternal um, uh, baby interaction and breastfeeding and the rest of it. And um, but uh, it's also been linked to treating migraine. Um, what part of the evidence is that sometimes in, in the menstrual cycle or, or related to pregnancy, migraine can be triggered by a decrease or is temporarily associated with a decrease in oxytocin. So some people began experimenting in um, investigator initiated trials and small things. Some of the experts uh, tell us that they use uh, com compounded uh, intranasal oxytocin uh, for migraine. But there's no real data on it. So um, we, we actually acquired uh, the assets of a company called Trigemino, where the, the uh, uh, founders were, were people like David Yeomans, who's a professor at Stanford, um, and uh, they, they have very interesting data. There, there are two aspects to it. One is oxytocin. The other is intranasal oxytocin. It turns out that there's a very unusual pathway where intranasal proteins of the size of oxytocin get taken up and brought to the trigeminal ganglia. And uh, you know, this is a site where many people have located some uh, migraine origins. And we think it's related to CGRP, but we think that the um, effect of oxytocin on oxytocin receptors is proximal to the um, release of, of uh, CGRP. So we, we think it's mechanistically related, but um, you know, maybe maybe uh, you know, slightly different, obviously a different receptor. Um, so uh, you know, we're they, they've done. Um, uh, two studies that were inconclusive. One, one was a South American study and one was an investigator-initiated study, both small here. But I think the the problem when, when we acquired this asset was they really hadn't spent the time to um, uh, you know focus on the device. And that's the kind of expertise that we bring in. So we've really focused on the drug device combination. And uh, you know, we've we've done a lot of work on it and we think that um we'll be in a position to start a uh, phase two efficacy study uh, in the uh, second half of this year. Great, thanks. Now to the last point in the uh, panel discussion with respect to the therapeutic indications we're focusing on, the addiction space, 
Uh, I wanted to preface this by talking a little bit about the opioid addiction crisis, because I'm sure that is an area with which uh, our audience is very familiar. It's been discussed very widely in the popular press. Uh, tens of thousands of people die every year in the United States from opioid-involved overdoses. Uh, the misuse of and addiction to opioids, including prescription pain relievers, heroin, and synthetic opioids like fentanyl, is a serious crisis. And effectively, the Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention has estimated that the total economic burden of prescription opioid misuse alone in the U.S. is around $80 billion per year. So while these painkiller agents have historically been considered extremely effective and have been widely considered mainstays of therapy for an extended period of time, the problems that they appear to cause seem now to begin to outweigh their benefits. And so... As the audience has now heard, uh, there is massive demand for non-opioid, demonstrably non-addictive modalities to treat some of these acute as well as chronic pain indications. So I just wanted to preface this section of the panel by um, giving the audience a sense of the scope and nature of that problem. But I think it would be very helpful to start perhaps with Mark in a discussion of the addiction space, since I understand that uh, you have a collaboration with NIDA in this arena. Uh, yes, yes, we do. Um, so NIDA uh, approached us because uh, within our portfolio, we have an orally uh, active biased mu agonist. It, its name is TRV734. The NIDA group has pioneered uh, with some animal model work and then some experimental models in individuals with opioid use disorder, an interest in uh, biased mu agonists as potentially best in class options for use in medication uh, assisted therapy, uh, which is really a mainstay treatment. Think uh, methadone, uh, buprenorphine is an accompanying treatment to a behavioral component. Uh, for transition from street drug use to an opioid-free state. It's probably one of the best and most effective uh, modalities of treatment that we have. However, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, mu agonist replacement uh, therapy in that uh, context is very problematic because of tolerability uh, concerns. The benefit of having a biased uh, mu agonist is that it potentially offers the ability to uh, provide the mu agonist uh, replacement, which would reduce the craving um, that is a necessary component of the behavioral uh, treatment of opioid use disorder, while at the same time avoiding some of the opioid-related adverse events that impair adherence to these treatments, particularly um, gastrointestinal dysfunction, uh, cognitive clouding that accompanies uh, that treatment, that becomes a very, very difficult problem for patients when they need to take these uh, therapies for extended uh, periods of time. So NIDA uh, reached out to us with an interest in exploring the utility of TRV734 and showed it was active um, and showed a very good profile in their animal models. And they're on the cusp of embarking on their first uh, inhuman uh, exploratory study in patients with opioid use disorder. So more to come on that uh, in the in the coming months. Great, thanks. And then Seth, maybe we could conclude this section of the panel discussion with you walking us through uh, your approach at Tonics with respect to addressing stimulant addiction. Yes, uh, we have quite an unusual um, uh, program, unusual in several ways, and usually exciting, I think. Uh, our, our program has been in development for many years, but we just in licensed it um, about two years ago from Columbia University. And um, uh, there's a big problem of deaths related to uh, cocaine use in the United States. The latest CDC numbers show an alarming increase. It's just a straight up curve of uh, deaths associated with um, uh, cocaine in the United States. And um, so we're developing a uh, enzyme that originally comes from a bacteria that grows near the roots of coca plants in the plantations in Colombia and other places where cocaine is, um, you know, is cultivated. And this bacteria has developed a very efficient cocaine uh, esterase such that this, this bacteria um, 
feeds, it, well, its sole source of carbon and nitrogen is cocaine. So this is just cocaine that leaches away from the roots. Uh, and this work has been the subject of numerous things. There was a Nature News and Views article on it, and they called these bacteria nature's addicts. Anyway, but Columbia, over a period of time, uh, mutated Columbia in conjunction with the University of Kentucky and University of Michigan, uh, selectively mutated certain residues in the enzyme to make it thermostable because the temperature of the soil in Columbia is obviously lower than the temperature of blood. So this enzyme uh, works in vivo. Uh, there was Before we licensed it, there was already a phase two study where uh, cocaine users, volunteers, were given 10 uh, milligrams of cocaine IV and uh, treated with either placebo or two doses, uh, two different doses of this uh, cocaine esterase. And it very rapidly disintegrates cocaine in the bloodstream. One of the most compelling uh, stories that I've seen about it is that you can give lethal doses of cocaine to rats so that they're seizing and in a situation where 100% of the rats die, and peripheral administration of this enzyme saves them all and they stop seizing. And the reason is that it decreases the cocaine concentration so rapidly in the periphery that the gradient of concentrations uh, effectively, the blood sucks the cocaine out of the brain, uh, where then you know it's further degraded. So uh, we, um, you know, we already have under our belt this phase two study in the volunteers in a laboratory setting, and the phase two that we're about to start is in the emergency room setting. And basically, the reason why we have, I mean, effectively, you can think of this as a Narcan for cocaine. But the reason you can't have a traditional Narcan for cocaine is that um, opiate, um, opiates are an agonist at their receptor. So you can use a, a drug like a Narcan or naloxone, which is an antagonist. But for cocaine, cocaine is an antagonist at its relevant transporter. And that's why there's no obvious way to block it except by this technology, which is effectively to seek and destroy. So we're very excited about this. I mean, obviously it doesn't deal with the underlying problem of why the person was taking the cocaine in the beginning, but we, we hope that it can be a life-saving medicine for use in the emergency room, and that hopefully people who survive these kinds of episodes uh, you know, could then be, uh, you know, get treatment for the underlying problem. Thank you. Very interesting work there. Now, I wanted to touch upon within the context of clinical development across pain indications, uh, a very important topic, which often is cited to me by investors looking at pain management strategies and companies pursuing these. And that's the subject of managing placebo responses in pain indication studies, because placebo responses are notorious uh, across the CNS space, but perhaps particularly so in the pain domain. Uh, so Norbert, I was wondering if you could provide us with some perspectives on this and uh, what your experiences have been addressing this as Aptinix has embarked upon conducting clinical development in neuropathic pain. Yeah, so <clears throat> as you stated, right, placebo is an issue we actually have to embrace. And we at Aptinix go about it in two ways. Uh, if I use the fibromyalgia indication, again, as an example, it was very important for us to show in our study that the benefit of NYX2925 actually can be seen in multiple different readouts when we look at these patients. I mentioned at the biomarker level, a clear change in functional MRI of hyperconnectivity in certain brain regions associated with the perception and processing of pain. I mentioned glutamate levels at the subjective level of patients assessing their pain. We look at average daily pain. We look at worst daily pain, pain on walking. We look at the fibromyalgia questionnaire, the promise fatigue scale. And I mentioned that, Ram, because for us, it's really important to recognize that there has to be a more holistic benefit to patients, not just along the measures I just mentioned, but also including mood, 
sleep improvements because mood and sleep are directly affected by chronic pain. And that's why we are so excited about NMDA receptor mediated changes of plasticity because that's known to be associated with these various readouts that are described, including sleep as well as mood. Regarding uh, management of uh, placebo response, so if I use the current study we are doing with fibromyalgia in 300 patients and in DPN with 200 patients, and reflect on the 300 patient DPN study that we did before we entered this next phase 2B, what we actually found is that you can mitigate the placebo response. We do so with a handheld device that patients use, and they have to have consistent high levels of pain. They have to have a certain pain level, and they need to actually record their pain scores on a daily, regular basis. Otherwise, they can't really participate in the study. And that gives us, I think, a very tight range of pain scores as well as compliance of patients that has served us really well in the studies we have done. And that's, of course, why we continue to use those tools. So while uh, we cannot completely avoid placebo response, I think we can indeed mitigate it, but it continues to be an area of focus for all of us because I am always concerned that perfectly viable drugs that we are testing in the clinic are ultimately failing because we cannot show a large enough delta between active and placebo, primarily because the placebo response can be rather dominant. And so, so far, so good. And I hope it continues on that path that we can mitigate it, uh, even if we cannot fully avoid it altogether. Thanks very much. And uh, I was wondering, Randall, if you could provide your perspectives on how you're looking at this within the context in particular of knee osteoarthritis pain. Yeah, so uh, to Norbert's uh, comments, so when you get uh, highly variable pain reporters, removing those patients uh, by selectively doing, let's say, an uh, numeric pain rating scale beforehand every day for a week or two, and those who have a high coefficient of variation of standard deviation, about 1.2, removed from the trial because actually they add noise uh, to the trial itself and actually reduce your power. Uh, other things that we've done is training placebo, uh, both for the sites as well as for the subjects. And uh, placebo training can take many different forms. Uh, one is to, as an example, uh, just when anyone interacts with the subject, they can enhance the placebo effect. So even the receptionist who says, hello, Mrs. Smith, you're looking great today, you just ruin that day. So uh, it's placebo training at the site. All subjects uh, and, and the sites are trained. And the subjects actually in our uh, informed consent are told that the uh, staff at the investigative sites will be highly professional. It's not that they're not compassionate, but they, it, for the purposes of reducing the placebo effect, they will be professional, uh, somewhat cool. And also, uh, we put that in, as I said, the informed consent, and we train the uh, sites on that, including the receptionists. Other aspects to this is you can train patients, and that's the work of Matt Katz, to actually report pain better. I think the issue is that, from a, particularly for large clinical trials, the ability to do that efficiently and effectively and cost-effectively is quite difficult. So we do uh, other measures for that. A couple other things to consider is that when you tell subjects or you tell these sites that your primary endpoint is week 12, things happen at week 12 that don't happen at the other times. And so one of the things we've started to do, both for some of our inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, is to actually blind it to the investigators. So we don't tell them what the pain range is to get included. We don't tell them what the HAD score is or the fibromyalgia symptom score, or central pain score is to be excluded. We uh, actually have used a, an algorithm which the physicians or the uh, data managers 
put data into it from the screening, inclusion exclusion criteria, and then the algorithm says you're randomized or not, but it doesn't tell they're not randomized or randomized. And from that standpoint, then what we have is a blinded protocol from the standpoint of those things uh, like pain scores that uh, the investigated sites don't have. Of course, the full unblinded one goes to the IRBs and to the FDA and EMA. But there are different, I think the attack on placebo responses is multimodal and it's different components, both from the standpoint of bias introduced by the investigator sites and and the site coordinators. It is the placebo effect of the high, you're looking great. And it's also explaining to patients that they must be truthful about how they're feeling. That's what the doctor and the study coordinator want. They are trying to figure out if this is a good therapeutic or not. And by not reporting accurately, you're actually undermining the whole point of the trial. I think those are some of the things that one can do to try and minimize the uh, placebo effect. Thank you. If we go now to regulatory perspectives, I think, Andrea, it would be very interesting for you to elaborate on two topics that may be relevant specifically for GB. One is on the level of phytochemicals and how you're looking at those in terms of what category of therapeutic they fall under if you are looking at these as prescription grade products or if you're thinking about in some contexts the application of these as medical foods. And also, if you could give us a sense of how you're interacting with regulators on the subject of the development of uh, novel cannabinoids uh, or naturally occurring cannabinoids as prescription grade products, uh, as opposed to medical cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So while it is true that um, there are many people that are using these kinds of compounds in medical foods, our focus is on uh, the prescription application and through regulated channels and with um, significant data to support the use of these compounds. Our approach thus far has been to use combination of, of naturally occurring compounds, but that in combinations for which we can demonstrate that there is synergy in the molecules, meaning that the effectiveness of the mixture is greater than the sum of the individual effects of the ingredients. And so that's one of the, the things that I think is somewhat novel. Is, so it's not just a combination therapy where you're taking two things at work and putting them together, you're actually getting synergy in these mixtures. And so uh, one of the things that remains to be done is we are we are headed to one of our first uh, you know, meetings with FDA, a pre-IND meeting, where we need to discuss things like how, how best to um, design the trials, how many arms are gonna have to be in these trials, to are we gonna have to prove out the efficacy of each of these individual ingredients separately and in the mixtures, or will they accept that the idea that this synergy of, mic of, of ingredients is actually a single API? And so that's something that yet, is yet to be determined. Uh, the other thing is there is a, a huge regulatory difference if the source of your molecules are plant-derived. There are many, especially the cannabis plant has had, um, you know, a role in history. And there are rules that state that ca that cannabinoids or any compound that is derived from the plant is a schedule one by default, even if it has no psychoactive components. So that's one of those challenges that we have to uniquely um, navigate. So one of our approaches has been to, while our Formulas have been plant inspired, meaning we did a lot of natural chemistry and um, to, to come up with the formulas that we then validated in cell and animal models. Um, we have switched and the source of our materials is Puracis, where they're creating a synthetic, uh, synthetic ingredients for us under CGMP, such that we can avoid some of the extra levels of regulation that come from a plant derived uh, product. Uh, so those are some of the unique challenges that you have when you're working in that sort of natural product space. But one of our strategies for trying to avoid some of the extra levels of scrutiny is to switch from plant-derived ingredients to synthetic copies to try to get them to examine the mixture as a single API. As a single API. And then um, we are also pursuing... Um, so we're also pursuing the use of these ingredients in these novel 
uh, na these nanos, the nano oral nanoparticles. So that will be another level of scrutiny that we'll uh, have to work with uh, FDA on ways to manage that in trial. Thanks very much. And uh, I think uh, we certainly would benefit from hearing the big pharma perspective on regulatory interactions and uh, maybe some lessons learned, advice, as it were, with respect to discussions that have been held with some of the major regulatory agencies, including, of course, the FDA. So, Pradeep, I think in particular, um, two of the elements that I think are perhaps most crucial are when we look at the migraine space and certainly feel free to opine on any other uh, indications that are of relevance with respect to the context of the panel discussion here. Um, what, the regula what, what the regulators have historically indicated are their principal concerns or what they're principally looking for in terms of comparative effectiveness and also what they are seeking in terms of how you how you define the key target patient population and how that guides your interaction with the regulators you know for example from a labeling perspective yeah uh, that's, that's a loaded question ram um obviously you know uh <clears throat> the safety was were, is is an is something that we very carefully look at in you know before you know we embark into any kind of development but with you know coming coming to this specific part, you know the cgrp development i think it'll it'll help to understand we were like hyper focused on when we dealt with regulators fda that you know how the labeling should come because first thing we really wanted to have you know the scheduling the you know the dea scheduling completely out of the question so that you know whether any dedicated studies were to be done or you know how to get rid of that you know because of the we knew that opioids and even though triptans didn't have it but any kind of central pain or any pain regulation we are worried about this scheduling, but if the drug is scheduled, obviously the commercial and the marketing, uh, you know, uh, it limits uh, to some extent. Other aspect was we we really wanted to focus on was to get not to get any medication overuse headache uh, statements in the label, and uh, whether a dedicated study was was required with CGRPs or not, but. But it seems like that based on the discussion of today's topic about, you know, drug abuse and, and pain, there's a, you know, the basic biology of these are, uh, there's some, there are some similarities here. And, and we did not have to do a study on MOH, medication overuse headache, because the pharmacology and the biology of an antagonist is kind of a little bit different than if we, we were to develop an agonist, for example, opioids and triptans. So uh, I think these are the two, two uh, things that we were like hyper-focused on, you know, from the get-go. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that to the other panel members to, to talk about it. Okay, great. Um, we're running short of time. So I think the final topic I wanted to just briefly touch on, and perhaps, you know, Mark, Pradeep, you can uh, weigh in here. Uh, given your experiences in the field with uh, approved drugs in these arenas. Marketing strategies, you know, do's and don'ts, so to speak. Uh, what you've found so far has been most resonant. Uh, what you think is likely to be the most productive approach to take with your respective products. And I think, Mark, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I, I would point out that, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, how we approach uh, clinical development, how we establish efficacy and safety, and that's obviously front and center in terms of a regulatory filing and getting a product uh, to market. However, the most critical thing um, in launching a product is beyond the RCT evidence that you bring to the table. The question really is the reimbursement environment and the payer. So uh, it is absolutely imperative uh, to start uh, early and to think thoroughly, both in terms of instrumentation within the clinical program, as well as the analyses and approaches that are going to be taken to demonstrate uh, the health economic uh, profile. What exactly is the value of the, um, the efficacy and safety profile that's been 
brought forward. It's all well and good to have a regulatory approval in hand, but absent an ability to fully articulate the uh, the health economic value that's uh, presented by the product, um, you're you're really uh, it's a non-starter from that point of view. So at um, Trevina, we've in, we've invested a considerable amount of time and thought in uh, the instruments that we put into the clinical trials, as well as the types of health economic models and documentation that accompanies the actual evidence for efficacy and safety. Without that, without those two things in hand, um, simply the RCTs alone uh, are not enough in this day and age to, uh, to convince broader utilization of the product. Pradeep, maybe we can close with you, uh, you know, kind of your thoughts on marketing strategies. I think in particular, we've seen pretty aggressive direct-to-consumer marketing strategies for anti-migraine medications of these new classes of drugs, but uh, just thought maybe you could offer some thoughts before we close. Yeah, yeah. So so I think in, in my opinion, uh, you know, the, the strat marketing strategy uh, is, is very key, especially in migraine because there are so, so many generics available at a much cheaper price. So how do you strategize that? So, you know, you, you, you know it, it has to start from the very beginning that, you know, are, you, are, are we going to achieve something beyond what the triptans and, and mu opioids can deliver? So this is, this, this, this is the challenge. And, you know, we are dealing with it and, and we've been very successful in, in, in strategizing some of the marketing strategies. But, you know, the problem is like when you have anti-epileptics, which are like, you know, you can get it in, in a dollar, you know, pricing. And how, how, do you, how do you price your drug if you don't have, you know, a huge differences between, between the efficacy and safety tolerability profile? Uh, from generics. So that's, that's the, I think, the challenge. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're unfortunately going to have to leave it there. This has been a very stimulating discussion. I want to thank each and every one of the panelists for their value-added contributions and look forward to hopefully uh, moderating another one of these stimulating discussions in the very near future. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.